California edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are coming to you from Sacramento, the state's capital, and today we are joined by Jimmy Gomez. He is a member of the California State Assembly. And, sir, I know it was a busy 2013. A busy 2014 is before us. Lots of exciting legislation. I hear you have a surprise for me. We'll see in a moment. Yeah. What are you working on? So I'm working on an issue that impacts uh, millions of Americans, but they don't even know about it. Okay. And that is the California Unclaimed Property Fund. Okay. Uh, the Unclaimed Property Fund contains $6.4 billion. That's B, you know, yeah. a billion uh, with a B. Right, right. right? That um, uh, has access of 21 million Californians. And this is from old bank accounts, right. uh, uncashed un, uh, rebate checks, right. you name it, it's in Stocks, this fund. bonds. Exactly. Everything is that, that people don't claim ends up in this fund. So we have a fund that's $6.4 billion worth. I know the controller runs that fund. Yeah. I know there's a website. I looked at it a few years ago. Yeah. I have a feeling maybe I should be looking at it sooner. You should. You should. Because uh. one of the, and out of the millions of people, guess who I found? You found me. I found you. Uh. So oh, I brought a check from the state of California for wow. $183.26. I love this. So if you go to the website and fill out a simple form, you can claim your property. I like this and, better, though. And this is your money. That's did, what's brilliant. Did it say, do you remember, what, or, or could you even figure out what it was from? Uh, it says, but I'm not going to say it good, good. On, uh, on there. But, I like uh, this better because yeah. this is a great keepsake. Yeah, so this is for you, Brad. But there's, Thank you, there's Assemblyman. There's thousands of people. In my district alone, we had 200,000 people with wow. unclaimed assets. And your district is about 500,000 people. Exactly. Can I tell you, when I looked at the, this is fantastic. Yeah. When I looked at the website, I'm leaving, I'm gonna put it up right here. Okay. I love this. When I looked at the website a few years ago, yeah. I found two of my four grandparents there and they never lived in California. Yet somehow yeah. some assets wound up there. Exactly. And so it really is a treasure trove. It is. And like you said, this is our money. Yeah. It, it's, it could be a gift card. It could be a gift card. It can be a rebate that the state you're supposed to get from a telephone company. It can be from anywhere from a few cents to thousands of dollars. And that's one of the things I discovered, that there's a lot of nonprofits, clubs, oh. and former organizations that existed but no longer exist that have accounts that ended up in this fund. So you have new legislation yeah, pending and, on this. Yeah, and what it, what it is is that because these um, clubs that were chartered by, say, like YMCA, AYSO, right. different organizations disbanded, there's no one there to claim it. So what I'm doing is introducing legislation that will give uh, streamline the authority of the controller's office, the state controller, to um, recognize their um, legitimacy to claim that unclaimed property. I see. So, and this helps uh, communities because it still fulfills the mission of that original nonprofit, community group, you name it, church. You, it's it's a, interesting you say that because when I found the funds of my grandparents, they had been deceased it was not going to be easy to access the money. We were going to have to show them a death, death yeah. certificate, a will, probate. Yeah. I know your bill deals with something separate, but at least there's some cleanup legislation yeah, correct. that is moving forward. So how's the, how's the bill doing? So we're developing the uh, language now, and the controller's office has agreed to uh, co-sponsor the legislation. So what will happen will be if the organization is defunct, a successor organization can come yeah, in? Yeah, the chartering organization. Oh, so AYSO National, for example. Uh, yeah, or the local group or a church that had a, um, a club on, uh, you know, that was associated with it, that had an account, that church will be able to claim it. So we're still working out the details, but it's a way to get money back into right. the community okay. that no, that if we don't do it, it's just going to be in an account that cannot be used. His name is Jimmy Gomez. For our viewers on HLN, I want to thank you so much for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll continue our conversation with Assemblyman Gomez, talk about the state budget, the state's rainy day fund. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We'll be right back. So, sir, let's talk about the budget, because as we mentioned, uh, the state has a nice chunk of money in this unclaimed property fund, but it also has a nice little surplus. Yes. Which, I can't believe we have a surplus. I've been hosting this mm. show for years. I never thought I'd say surplus. We have a surplus. We do. How did that happen? You know, I think it was really just um, leadership in the legislature mm. and in the governor's office that uh, put us on a financial track over the last, you know, four to five years. Right. We, they really took the hard... Uh, steps to get our fiscal house in order and to ensure that we weren't um, overspending outside our means. The economy picked up, and once the economy picked up, uh, we had more um, money in our right. in our accounts. And Prop 30. And Prop uh, hard to deny. And Prop 30 
uh, played a big role, but even prop, uh, above Prop 30, the economy is moving along, creating more jobs, more of a tax base, more revenue, and helping us so all So what should we do with the surplus? There's a lot of competing interests out there. The governor seems to favor some increases in spending, but more focus on a rainy day fund. I know assembly leadership, Senate leadership, is looking at creating a universal pre-K program. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of different ideas. Now, we have to do both, Brad. Okay. Um, for, for one, there's a lot of people in this recovery that have been left out and are still hurting. We have to help them out when it comes to um, government services as well as making sure that they have access to uh, you know, transitional kindergartner, you right. name it. We have to kind of help those people that are not feeling the economic recovery as, as the rest of us are. But how do we do this in a way so we don't create new programs, new entitlements that could bite us yeah. you know, a few years? Would it be through creating, creating new programs or should we look at uh, restoring funding that had been cut during the bad times. Yeah, we're looking at restoring a lot of funding, one of it, or allowing certain cuts not to take place. Mm. I know there's discussions regarding uh, the Medi-Cal cuts that were I, supposed I, to take I, place, right. so we're looking at that. Um, but at the same time, everybody agrees that we have to create a rainy day fund in order to avoid those deep cuts that we experienced uh, in prior years. And let's talk about that rainy day fund, because what many voters or viewers may not realize is we technically have a rainy day fund. The voters passed Proposition 58 in 2004, mm -hmm. but I guess it wasn't written in a way that made it ironclad, and so it has not been well funded. When right. it was funded, the money was taken out fairly quickly. Yeah. And so what do we need to do? Do we need to amend Prop 58? Do we need to just scrap it and start over? Uh, I think the governor and the legislative leadership are looking into um, what the best avenue is. I know right. that it wasn't ironclad, but also didn't provide the flexibility needed mm -hmm. Um, in order to make um, decisions when it comes to the right. budgeting. So I think they're, they want to make it so that we are putting money in a rent -a day fund, but provides that flexibility at the same time. Let's remember the first year of the recession, it was, I believe, a, a $40 billion yeah. cut. Yeah, no, uh, Second year yeah. was $20 billion. Yeah, That's was, a $60 billion yeah, no, was, cut over two years. And a budget that we we had, what, at the time, $120 right. billion, I yeah, believe, $110, yeah. $120 no, you're billion. You're right, you're right. So, it's going to take a while to build up that rainy day fund, but it's better to start now than wait till later. What about what the governor calls the wall of debt? The $25 billion that are owed on various loans, deferred payments, and that's putting aside pensions. We'll get there in a second, no. but what about that wall of debt? You know, uh, we do have to figure out what to do with the wall of debt. Um, our credit rating um, mm -hmm. is kind of directly tied to how we're handling that debt. Getting better, though. Yeah, it's getting better. Right. But the the more we have the the more specific plan that we have in dealing with it allows the um, rating agencies to lower our our or increase our debt rating and thereby lowering the amount we're right. paying towards the right. debt and therefore giving us more flexibility in the budget. Right. So all in all, it's a good way to approach it. Um, but you know, there's still a lot of negotiating that has to occur. What about on the question of pensions? Because that is a wall of debt the size of bigger than the Great Wall of China. I mean, it's over two hundred billion dollars in unfunded liabilities. Well, the 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 pension issue is something that first it's a it's a promise that um, we have already made, mm. and we have to figure out how to keep that promise to the workers of California. Although and to their it's business. interesting because there's a mayor in San Jose who'd like to tinker with those promises. Yeah, and I believe he's wrong. Um, I think that if you made a promise, then you have to keep them, and that's how a lot of the, the if you look in cities who have tried to deal with this, the courts have said time and time again, if you made a promise right. when it comes to pension obligations, then you are required to keep that promise. But on a go-forward basis, changes can be made. Yeah, and those are usually negotiated right. between uh, the collective bargaining of unit course. and the government. But do we need to be spending more of our surplus on p refunding, meaning well, giving more well, funds to our pension well, obligations? Well, we should have avoided getting in that situation oh, yes. in the first place. And we, did, and we didn't do that because we did, when we had the, the, the strong times, we didn't put the money in that right. we should have. Okay, his name is Jimmy Gomez. Thanks for this, my friend. I'm Brad Palmer. It's, it's California Edition. What is the highest number of unclaimed properties returned to owners in a given fiscal year?
California edition coming to you from Sacramento, California. I'm Brad Pomerantz, and we are joined by Sebastian Ridley Thomas. He is a member of the California State Assembly, one of the newest members, of course. How's your new job? It's great, and it's a wonderful opportunity to serve the people of the 54th district. Which is my 54th. district. That's right, the I Fighting like 54th. Right. I like it. I like it. <laughs> you had worked for a senator? Yes. And an assembly member, or just a senator? Just a senator. Okay, the so Honorable how... Curran D. Price. Right, so how is it on the other side of the, the well, Capitol? Well, the, the color of the carpet in the right. Senate is red, that in, in, in the assembly is green. And uh, the bills uh, still have to get passed. I was going to say, <laughs> so let's talk about the big bill. Yeah. The big bill being the budget. The BB. Yeah, the big bill, the BB. <laughs> and so I want to get a sense from you about the budget process. We know that in January, the governor proposes his budget. He'll put us through a May revise in May, but we do. And in that time period, the legislature right. disposes and uh, opines and uh, gives its opinion on various aspects of the budget bill. Assembly Democrats put out a budget blueprint, right. which is a framework and outline for priorities, not necessarily representative of everyone in the caucus, but really in conjunction with the assembly leadership, right. Speaker Perez, Chair, Budget Chair Nancy Skinner, right. and the senior leadership team. And many of their uh, 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 pronouncements and suggestions have been incorporated. One which we hope to see more tangible uh, legs on in the budget that was mentioned in the budget is early childhood education there. and universal preschool. And let's do talk about that because there is no doubt that before the governor presented his January proposal, Senator Steinberg, Speaker Perez announced that one of their major initiatives for the year would be universal pre-K. And if you look at the governor's proposal, that really wasn't in there. Well, there, there are monies for early uh, childhood uh, education writ large. There are monies for uh, community colleges and right. increasing the number of transfers to UC yes. their grants. Those impact those who would be trained and performing at the school. Right. So the governor takes a rather strategic and global approach. The, the legislature will have to give definition and structure toward in negotiation with the administration to look at uh, what the expansion looks like, how we manage getting uh, three to five year olds into public schools and uh, also working with the current system which is largely private right? Um, right. and uh, making sure that we have a trained, credentialed and continually educated workforce which is a key, key uh, part of this conversation. But what we know from Senator Steinberg, the pro tem, and Speaker Perez is to fund a program like universal pre-K would be about a billion dollars a year. Correct. Now, But there, it, the, the proposal, I think, from both legislative leaders is a phase-in. It's not it a one-time. It is. And uh, if it's a phase-in, I would argue that we need to have a, a mix of public and private because some of these uh, uh, private uh, child care organizations are uh, rather effective. Uh, many are women-owned businesses, mm -hmm. and in my community, they are vital uh, interaction between uh, education, child care, community building. So we'll have to have a conversation but about that. Do you feel as if the governor is willing to move on this? We do have a surplus, you know, over $4 billion, but the governor seems to be very committed to creating that rainy day fund, which I want to talk about more as we progress. You know, creating another entitlement. program entitlement, you know, is it the right time to do it? Well, uh, it's a strategic investment in the future. The question is, uh, uh, when will we have another opportunity to begin this conversation in a tangible way? To miss the opportunity to invest in early childhood education pre uh, six, uh, six year old, uh, uh, prior to being right. six years old, is a, something that I think is. Uh, well, let's we continue can't this pass. conversation. Yeah. For our viewers on HLN, thanks for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. So there's no doubt that this is a moment in time where one could argue that we should seize the day. Right. And we seize the day by actually passing a universal pre K. But look, this governor, he, he, he has said in no uncertain terms that he wants a rainy day fund set up. Right. You can't do it all. Right. So what's your sense, if we can kind of shift gears, about the creation of a rainy day fund? Well, there are two aspects of it with respect to fiscal discipline. And we must, I think you and I have discussed before, yes. salute the voters for majority vote. Uh, uh, authority and for the temporary tax increases uh, contained in Prop 30 as well as the 
it's not a cliff effect, so we don't just stop and have a drop off. There's a tiered phase right. out in, at, at the end of seven years, right. six from now, uh, on, on Prop 30. Uh, that helps the majority party exert fiscal discipline, and this is why we will have the fourth on-time balanced budget in uh, uh, as many years, and that is unprecedented in the modern era of legislation. And miraculous when you consider the last decade and how dramatic and draconian. Dramatic. So with respect to our debt and uh, deficits, deficit has been uh, largely erased, the structural deficit, because of Prop 30, because of actions by Democrats over the past six to eight years. Um, the ongoing challenges with respect to debt reduction, the so-called wall of debt, uh, as well as the management of uh, state resources, uh, you can call it reserve or a rainy day fund, they have different meanings. Right. So the rainy day fund right. mean, uh, uh, refers mostly to the uh, projected budget year. The uh, a reserve refers uh, to the uh, it's a it's a cash operating fund during the year. So many cities um, uh, use this technique. The state has not often used it in the last few years. So we're looking at paying down the, the wall of debt strategically and aggressively. Uh, we're looking at particularly the high interest debt that we took out during uh, the mm -hmm. years when we had a, a, a worse credit rating. Um, then we're looking at uh, having a healthy reserve, an annual reserve, uh, when uh, expenses uh, uh, surpass or collections don't meet expectations at certain time periods. That's why we don't have to go to market. We don't have to pick up Got the it. tax allocation mm -hmm. notes a as often. Uh, and then we're looking at um, additional reforms to make sure the government is efficient, is effective, that it uh, appropriately addresses a rate of growth and challenges with regulation and programs that need to be restored or priorities such as early childhood. The, uh, the argument being right. is that if you invest on the front end, there is much less expensive than on the back end through incarceration, through mental health, through rehabilitation programs, through the criminal justice system. Well, Early childhood right. is a correlative uh, spending. Well, as I understand it, what oftentimes happens is those that work in prison systems look at third grade reading results. Yeah, and, those who build prisons, yeah, right. in particular. And so they see how is the reading result in third grade, and that's how they predict how many Many predictors. Uh, high rates of foster care, mm -hmm. um, uh, which uh, have, a, unfortunately, we see a large rate of those who are involved in the sex trafficking industry, mm -hmm. particularly of minors. A significant number have been in foster care. But we uh, talk about prisons, if I may. Yes. That is another wrinkle in this whole budget battle because we know the federal court is overseeing the contraction of the prisons in our state. Right. And if the federal court, in a few weeks, months, hard to know, orders that the prison further contract, the governor has said that he's going to send these prisoners not out, but to other facilities which cost more money. And so that would be a place where we may need to access a reserve right. or a rainy day because it's going to cost over $300 million, million dollars to do that. Yes, certainly. And I don't know that it's actually, I, I think there may be a slight savings, frankly, in terms of the alternative custody uh, because there are a number of, that, that is to state custody right. with the private prisons and community health facilities or local facilities that are under capacity. Uh, there are some jurisdictions where some. We're, we're, we're under capacity. And most of the large southern urbanized or suburban counties, right. we are at or over capacity. Right. Many of the jails are under federal um, uh, scrutiny. Uh, the governor has been uh, rather forthright and uh, thoughtful about the issue from his days as the attorney general. And I'm glad to uh, be on the public safety committee and uh, working with the chairs of both houses. Uh, this is an important issue to LA County because we have such a large portion Huge. of the realignment population Huge. already. We're trying to see and measure how realignment has been implemented. So before we get another wave of people who are transferred to local custody, we need to make sure we get rehabilitation appropriately right. touched and the services in the local areas. His name is Sebastian Ridley Thomas, member of the California State Assembly. My name is Brad Palmer. It's this is California Edition. Sacramento, the state capitol. We are joined by Doss Williams. He is a member of the California State Assembly. And so I want to speak with you about the governor's recent state of the state address. 
uh, pretty well received by both Democrats and Republicans. Fairly short, I thought. In fact, I think it was 17 minutes. Yeah, I think <laughs> Lieutenant Governor uh, Gavin Newsom's intro was almost as long <laughs> as Governor Brown's. But what do you make of his state of the state address? Well, he packed a lot into that 17 he minutes. Um, he addressed the the issues at hand, um, both the good and the challenging. Um, the good is that we're really reinvesting in our public school system, um, that we um, he's embraced the idea that we brought forth in the assembly of a rainy day fund mm -hmm. uh, so that we store away money for the for the future. He, he uh, quoted the book of Genesis. Right, I, I um, heard that. Uh, saying uh, that when Joseph tells right. the Pharaoh, right. you store away grain in the years of plenty right. for the years of, of, of want. Can I actually ask you more about the rainy sure. day fund? Because it is a very interesting debate. We have a rainy day fund. The voters passed a rainy day fund in 2000, I think it was four, Proposition 58, but that rainy day fund really has not been seen as adequate. It hasn't been funded for years. Neither Governor Schwarzenegger or Governor Brown has funded it in the last five years. Why do we think a different rainy day fund would work? Because the, the rainy day fund that's being proposed takes into account um, spending money to pay down debt. Okay. And the other rainy day fund, the reason why it was uh, challenged, successfully right. challenged in the courts, was that it would have stopped us from being able to pay down our debts. When you, when you get, uh, if you have large credit card debt, right. right, you don't take the money coming in and immediately put it into an uh, interest-bearing account. You pay off right. your credit cards first, right? Uh, and that just makes good public... Uh, uh, sense the same thing that makes good sense for you as an individual makes good sense for the the, the the state. We need to pay off our debt, and so that is one of the priorities. And the rainy day fund that's being set up will still allow us to put away money, but won't sort of count the retiring of debt um, uh, against the percentage going in. And so, what about that debt? That wall of debt that Governor Brown discusses? It is quite significant. I mean, at least $25 billion, and that does not include our pension obligations right. and our retiree obligations. So our budgetary debt is about, 20, or was last year, about $25 billion. It is less now. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, the, um, with last year's budget, we were on a plan to pay it off within four years okay. by the expiration of uh, the Prop, uh, Prop 30. Um, however, I think the governor is, spe is planning on speeding it up a bit. Um, so we may be clear our budgetary debt um, in the next couple of years. At the same time, there is the notion that it's not necessarily a bad thing to have some debt and invest what you have in programs. And so I know, for example, the Assembly Democrats and Senate Democrats are high on a universal pre-K program. That's right. A billion and dollar program, and, and so and that's based on really the meta studies that are done in education outcomes. So if there's money coming to to education, uh, one of the basic questions is what what our local is going to spend it on. I would counsel for them to spend it largely on um, longer hours of instruction or longer hours at school, either additional school days or um, uh, uh, after school programming. Because the, the funny thing is, the longer students are at school, even if they're not doing schoolwork, the higher performing they well, become. When we come back, let, let's talk more about higher education, if we may. For our viewers on HLN, thank you so much for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. So, sir, we mentioned pre-K. You talk about K through 12. There's also the question of higher education. And when we look at higher education and we look at how the governor sets his priorities, it's hard to deny that he really has set K-12 as his primary focus. That's the grouping that's getting the lion's share of any surplus we have. Right. Higher ed is getting a bump vis-a-vis -vis last year, but nowhere to the extent that K-12 is. Is that of concern to you? It is. Uh, but I think philosophically the governor is in the right place by saying, that we're here to invest in the future, not squander it. And I would say one of the most important things that we could do to make sure that we're investing in the future is making sure that we are producing enough skilled, educated workers, i.e. graduates from our right. university system. 
I believe that is sort of our strong point in the economy. That's why some areas of the state are doing much better economically than others because they have informational-based businesses, knowledge-based businesses um, uh, in, you know, in the Bay Area counties that's causing growth to go through the roof. Yeah. And in the past, um, uh, past six years, we have actually reduced the number of graduates that we're producing. If we are going to increase our graduates at UC and CSU, there needs to be an additional budget allocation. And, but one way you're looking to do that, which does not implicate the state budget that much, was a bill that you uh, took through the legislature last year, signed by the governor, quite controversial, and the bill allows uh, a pilot program to move forward so that certain community colleges can create intercession classes and charge a higher rate. That's right. At this stage, only Long Beach City College has adopted the program. It started right now. They couldn't be happier. I mean, I've spoken with the chancellor, the trustees. They love the program. The other five institutions that have been permitted to uh, engage in the pilot have not moved forward yet. But talk to us about that sure. as, as one of the solutions that you've looked towards. Well, and, and these schools have only been legalized to do extension courses for the last three weeks. So Literally. Long Beach, Literally. Long, Long Beach is, is just very, right. very... Uh, 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 ambitious and put a lot of classes right. on the table uh, incredibly fast. Right. And those classes ended up being 80% subscribed, right. very popular, and they were able to do a lesser amount charged for low-income students to make sure that was still affordable for low-income students. What I found fascinating was when the governor signed the bill, he included a signing message. Usually, governors don't include signing messages. They include veto messages. So he knew what he was doing. He knew this bill was controversial, and his signing message was brief, basically said, let's give it a shot. Yeah. I mean, what, what's the big deal? That must have been gratifying it, for it, you. It really was you gratifying. Got, you took a beating on this. Yes, I, I sure did. Uh, and, but, of course, equally gratifying, I, I do believe that there's two more of the five uh, that are, are moving forward. Are they? I um, mean, yes. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, two of them right. that have communicated to us okay. that the they're going to move, move, still move forward. Still we're okay. working on it, um, uh, but it would be probably a summer intercession for oh. one of them, and then the other one would start in the, the following winter intercession. Speaking of um, winter, if I may, I sure. want to talk to you about the winter and how little rain we have right oh. now. Um, it is um, sad to me, actually. I mean, I literally feel a sadness when there's no rain. And the governor did talk about global warming, recently declared drought, an official declaration. What's your sense of where we are in terms of the drought declaration and what we can do as Californians? Well, I think we need to take it very, very seriously. Uh, there's an enormous amount that can be done by individuals to uh, arrest the drought. Right. Um, uh, in fact, in many communities that have been, you know, used to droughts more than others, like Santa Barbara and Ventura right. County, which I represent, um, immediately when a drought is called, people scale back by 20%. Right. And so the cheapest, fastest way we can get more water is to initiate conservation measures. Um, you I know. hate to do this to you, but sure. when I, I remember the saying from the 70s, which I've now adopted, you know where I'm going? I, I do know where you're going. It, if it's yellow, it's mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. You know what? I think that's I'm fine. To me, to me, that's just patriotic. Uh, you know, <laughs> patriotic. Uh, if we're, if we're going to be serious about the drought, right. of course, the other biggest area is in your landscape. Yeah, of course. Uh, people just uh, waste a huge amount of water um, in grass. And so communities, a lot of the communities in my district, you will, the, the, they will actually pay half of the value of re-landscaping uh, your yard. And those are the kind of measures. Um, uh, flippantly, they've been called cash for grass programs. We don't call there, it there, that. There's so many um, in, cliches in, we in, can in use. Santa Barbara. His name is Doss Williams, member of the California State Assembly. I'm Brad Palmer. It's California edition.